Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from St. John's Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they crowd out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits in the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits in the throne will spread His tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So far, text. Christian friends. I want to show you a book. Most of you have probably seen it. I usually pull it out in the middle of our instruction class. This is a Biblia Hebraica Stucardentia. It's great. It's the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. You actually read it backwards. So if you want to go to the beginning, of course, you have to go to the end. And Genesis is right back here. And so if I asked any of you to read this, you'd probably say, Pastor, I can't read that. I'd say, don't worry, I have a Hebrew grammar. And a dictionary. And I think some of you would still, most of you are still looking at me like he's being ridiculous again. There's no way I could read this. It's too confusing. And I would say, yeah, it's pretty bad. And you haven't even seen Greek yet. But I have to tell you that of all the books of the Bible that are confusing, that people just kind of scratch their head and say, what in the world? It would have to be Revelation. This is the third Sunday that we've been going into Revelation where we've seen our risen Redeemer revealed in this beautiful letter written. Some of the topics are confusing. Some of them in our text can be confusing also. And yet, I do not want to overshadow the big message of this book that is... Lauren, can you push the slide? Oop, too far. Back up more. There you go. It's Easter. Jesus lives. The tomb is empty. Our God wins. That is the theme of the book of Revelation. So no matter how confused you might get going through there in different pieces that you can't figure out, that one message is driven home over and over again. Our God wins. And on this Good Shepherd Sunday, I want you to know that our Good Shepherd makes the confusing simple. He makes the confusing clear. He will take us home one day. I want to start at the beginning of this text once more. Verse 9. You can push it one more slide, Lauren. Thank you. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Now, at first, this is pretty hard to understand. How could there be a great multitude that no one could count? That's like a stone so big you couldn't measure it or move it. It's ridiculous, right? And yet, I think we've seen this elsewhere, haven't we? If you go back to Genesis, and the patriarch Abraham, God told him to go outside his tent one night and to look up. And now you can push it, Lauren. One more slide. That is the Milky Way galaxy. My projector's not that good. And if you go out in the country in the middle of nowhere in a tobacco field in North Carolina, and you look up, it would look even more brilliant than that. And God would say to you and to Abraham, count the stars if you can. 
Now, I'm sure, sure some smart scientist has indeed counted all of them, but that's not the point. He's not asking Abraham to do a math exercise. He's telling him it's too many. Someday, if you could catalog them, I guess. But there's more than you can count. And when you reach heaven and you look over all the people in heaven, like the Apostle John, there's too many. There's so many people here, I can't even count them. Every tribe, every nation, people and language standing before the throne. And dear friends, you are children of Abraham. You are in that starlit sky. Your number will be in that big crowd. God's talking about you when He sees this. All right, take it away. Now, what's even more confusing about this is in chapter 7, in the verses prior to this, the Apostle John counts the number that's in heaven. He says that there's 144,000. He lists 12 tribes, not the 12 tribes, which even makes it more confusing. But the point is, if there's 144,000 people in heaven, and then in the next breath he says, I can't count them, could this number be symbolic? Maybe. Could this be 12 from the Old Testament, the 12 tribes? Could it be 12 from the New Testament, the 12 disciples? 12 times 12 is 144. 10 is the number of completeness. Now cubit, what do you get? 1,000. 144 times 1,000. All of the Old Testament Christians, all of the New Testament Christians who've ever lived are brought together into that number, 144,000. And I can't count them because there's too many. That is what people like me who read the Bible and say, what could God mean by this number in this book that's so full of symbolism that God tries to communicate to people? No one will be left out. All of those people will be there. That's what he's getting at. Well, we keep going. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. Lauren, push the next slide for us. That is a palm branch, and in the recent memory, when was the last time we held palm branches in this church? Palm Sunday, yes. Exactly. We celebrated the entrance of our king into Jerusalem. Now, sadly, that didn't last that long, and he ended up being crucified. And yet, when we get to heaven, the celebration of our king will be unending. And at the turn of... Of the previous century, do you know what would be inserted into the hand of someone who died as they laid in the, into the, in the coffin? Before they closed the door, there would be a palm branch in their hand on their chest. Now, of course, we don't need those in heaven. God will provide the palms. But the symbolism was powerful. And it pointed to this verse, that they will be in that throng, praising God one day. All right, take them away. As for the white robes, we're going to get to those in a second. I want to go to the next verse. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then you jump down. Verse 12, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Who's singing here? The angels? The elders? These are Christians. And then the four living creatures. Those are angels, our best guess. So there will be a whole lot of angels, and there will be a whole lot of people singing these praises. As for what these songs mean, well, they're songs of praise. That's not really that hard to understand. And yet, that last one, praise, glory, wisdom, thanks, honor, power, strength, there are more words to describe how great our God is, and yet there are seven words of praise here. And again, the picture is another one of completeness. Seven is God's number throughout the Bible, and here with their seven words of praise to describe him, that's just a complete song. That's not to say you can't write your own when you get there. But the praise of the saints will truly be complete. Now, verse 13, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? Now before I even approach the answer, this is a great opportunity to say, is there such a thing as a dumb question? No, 
There's not. Because every question that I've ever thought up, I had a chance to ask somebody smart before me. And oftentimes they said, I don't know. Because the truth is, God does not tell us all of the answers that we'd like to know, does He? Why is the sky blue? Tar Heel fans think they know the answer. God does not tell us in the Bible why the sky is blue. God does say who made the sky and the earth and everything. That's in the Bible. He says He did. He tells you how He did it. He even records it in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. What about, why did God take the person that I love away from me? Why did they have to die? God does not answer that question. A lot of the why questions that we want to know, we just don't. The events in Texas and Massachusetts scream out for whys, and yet, our God doesn't answer that. What He does answer is what happens to the person who dies in Christ. In Jesus, that person believed in Him. Where did He go? When will I see Him again? Those answers are clear. They're in heaven. You'll see Him on the last day. It'll be a big family reunion. You'll be there with all the other sheep. And the shepherd will be in the middle. That's His promise to us. Those are the questions that we long to ask for. And never stop asking them. Don't ever feel ashamed to ask about something. Because it's okay. It isn't, the question isn't the big deal. The big deal is where you go for the answer. And if you always go to God, He won't always be able to tell you because He doesn't answer some of our questions. But the ones that He does answer, those answers are so important. They can lead us out of so many problems. Always go to God when you, when you want to know a question. Well, the elder asked the Apostle John this question. These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, and he gives them the answer. Now this again seems a little ridiculous. Why this kind of game of question and answer and yet this happened again in the Bible? No other book in the Bible has more references to the Old Testament than Revelation. So go back to Ezekiel. And you see the prophet. And he's looking over a valley of dry bones. And do you remember what he asked God? There's an angel who said, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel said, you know. And he said, you had better believe they can live. Ezekiel was looking at the spiritual dead of Israel. And they did indeed come to life. St. John is looking at something a little bit different. He's looking at all the people in heaven. And the angel asks him, how'd they get, where are they from? And John goes, you know. He says, you bet I do. And he says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. What is the great tribulation? Now, you live in the Bible Belt, if you didn't know that. And you are surrounded by many Baptists who look at eschatology, the end of the world, and they divide it into about 60 different pieces. And they try to pigeonhole it. None of them agree exactly if it's pre- or post-tribulation, when the millennium will fall. And so much of that is not even true. It does not even apply. The Great Tribulation is the whole New Testament era. If you look at what Jesus said about signs of the end times, the destruction of Jerusalem was one of them. That was some 2,000 years ago. And... That passage, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation, that could be clearer. That's an ongoing present comment. These are they who have come and continue to come out of the great tribulation. People are still coming out of them. 2013, whew, you don't have to look at the news very long to see that the world is indeed troubled. And that we leave this veil of tears and we go to heaven. I can't wait to get there myself. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Well, the last part of that verse, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Just a word about robes. What? Not many of you have robes, I suppose. Maybe a bathrobe. God is, of course, talking about... Um, 
their works, their robes of righteousness. And yet I have to tell you, just the robe that I wear on a weekly basis for maybe a couple hours if I'm lucky, this gets kind of dirty. You wouldn't believe it, but there's been blood on this robe, wine, spit up. I know you're kind of going, how is that possible? Yeah, and just around the neck and the wrist, it kind of gets gross. And once in a while, Jenna approaches me and said, when was the last time you washed that thing? And I have to take it home. And it does wash up really well. But it gets kind of dirty. So I have to ask the question, how do you look, my fellow sheep? Are your robes spotless? Does your wool get stained? I don't know if it's so much stained, but I think we have other problems, don't we? As sheep, we worry what our wool looks like. And if we have enough wool. We have whole wardrobes full of wool because we're worried about running out, don't we? Wool for every day of the week. And we worry about what stall we get to stay in and what kind of shape that stall's in. And yet our shepherd says, you will always have wool and you will always have a safe stall. That's his promise, right? And the voices that we follow in this life, how many adult sheep follow the voices of their little lambs? That must be a, an interesting look when the farmer looks out and sees, the shepherd looks out and sees that in his pasture. Finally, I wonder if our sheep, if I as God's sheep doesn't follow every voice except the shepherd sometimes. Whether it be on TV or news or my friends or my family. And yet my shepherd's voice needs to trump them all. And this sounds so clearly in my ears that I never mistake what he says that he can always call me back. But dear friends, that's hard. Because I don't always listen to him. I don't always go to hear what he says on a daily basis. And that's confusing sometimes. Go back to your God. Go back to your shepherd as often as you can, my friends. To hear how much he loves you. To see the beautiful pasture that he has waiting for you. And to see how white your robe is. It has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That doesn't mean, my fellow sheep, that we stop sinning. It means that we are completely forgiven. And that our sins are taken away. Because our shepherd has hands that are holy. That is a pun. A bad one at that. But there's holes in it. And there's a gash in his side that shows how he gave up his life for us. Know that you never have to wonder or worry. And the last verses are almost too much to preach on. I could go for a whole other sermon, but I won't. I'll just end this sermon with a picture. Lauren, push it one more time for me. That's Iceland, if you're wondering. Beautiful. But hear this picture of heaven and just how white you are. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he who sits in the throne will spread his tent over again. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Dear friends, it's so simple, isn't it? God cuts through all the complicated things in life and just calls out to us when we're lost. He says that He loves us. And he wants us to come home. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.